Tonight, we will look at how the brain actually acquires its amazing abilities. Our subject is the developing brain. Every newborn is introduced to a world that is entirely foreign and unknown. However, the adaptive ability of the infant brain is nothing short of miraculous. Within days of birth, a newborn starts building the foundation for a lifetime of knowledge. He or she learns to respond to colors, to recognize objects, and to discern the properties of the physical world. In less than a year, most babies have already begun understanding language. Findings show that newborns possess much greater cognitive capacity than previously thought. Skills such as object recognition, facial recognition, and even basic number recognition can be inborn. One thing is certain, babies are much more than empty vessels waiting to be filled with knowledge. They are primed from birth to gather information on their own. An infant comes into the, into the world with an enormous curiosity to learn and acquires these abilities systematically. Not only do they learn very specific things to recognize faces, to recognize objects, but they learn abstract things. They learn how to acquire language, they acquire numerical systems. And what is interesting about this is that they don't do this instantaneously. They don't acquire all of these skills simultaneously. They do this in stages. Everybody, I think, understands this one big idea that somehow it's easier for children to understand languages than adults. Yes, that's the case. Uh, infants go about language using both innate skills and an incredibly powerful learning mechanisms that we're just beginning to understand. And whether they're born in Singapore or Paris or Seattle or New York, they'll all follow a set of universal stages, as uh, Eric alluded to. Uh, at three months, they'll coo. At seven months, they'll babble. At a year, a single word. At 18 months, two word combinations. And at the age of three, full sentences, they will talk your leg off. What is it about that brain that enables it to learn language better? Well, that's the question, Charlie. So no one debates this curve, but right. everyone is debating what's the cause of that function. Why mm -hmm. does it work in that way? Why does the baby brain work in a way that yeah. the adult brain doesn't? So the classic debates, they've gone on for centuries. So currently, uh, Noam Chomsky from MIT right. and B.F. Skinner, the late B.F. Skinner from Harvard, debated very different tasks, very different takes on this debate. Chomsky arguing the structure is built in the brain, and Skinner saying we're born a blank slate. So what's, what's new, what's happened? Well, what's happened is that the scientists got into the picture and started to actually study the brains and minds of children to look at their skills. And that's produced an entirely new view that isn't either of those canonical opposites, but something much more interesting. And I can illustrate it by taking one aspect of language, the development of the sound processing of language, okay? And show you how that works. So when we think about the sounds of language, each language uses a different set. So in Japanese, R and L are not distinct. To a Japanese speaker or listener, rice and lice are the same thing. Right. But in English, the kids have to learn that R and L are distinct. So how in the world do they come about doing this? But I think there's two other pieces of this puzzle, at least, uh, that we need to add into the mix in order to account for these uh, incredible feats that we see kids engaging in. The first of them is that children come into the world prepared to construe it in the same basic fundamental kinds of ways that we do. And that's going to be crucial because if I'm going to learn things from you, from what you do, I better be able to understand your actions and the things that you act right. on in the same general kinds of ways. So let me give you just one example of this. Like Eric, I brought a, a demonstration <laughs> in. A okay. learning tool. Very simple event. Uh, I'm going to take this cracker, yeah. put it into a cup, right. take it out again, put it in again. Right. You've now seen it go in and out three right. times. Uh, and over here, I'm going to take a cracker, put it into the cup, right. take out my empty hand, and now take a cracker and uh, put it into the cup. Right. Now, 
you saw more motion over here than you saw over here, but you'll immediately be able to say that there's uh, one object here, got to remind myself. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in my prime, I can immediately say there's one over here and uh, two over here. And what that ability shows is that we can take the surface appearances of things, the mm. momentary uh, entrance uh, of an object, and we can understand them as manifestations of a set of bodies that exist, whether we're looking at them or not, mm. uh, that behave in accord with uh, basic laws so we can predict what's going to happen next. We know you put something in a, a right. cup, it'll stay yeah. there unless uh, uh, you take it out. And this general ability, Piaget called object permanence, right. and he rightly pointed out that this is fundamental to our understanding of the world. So if we look at the pictures, you'll see what the brain looks like at 17 weeks of age. Notice how smooth it is. Yes. That's all the cells have made it in. And with time, we're gradually adding more and packing more so that by 40 weeks of pregnancy, mm -hmm. when the baby is born, it has quite a few cells. Now, this process is impacted by both external factors and internal factors. The internal factors are the genes. There are many molecules that are t telling cells where to go, how to find the right place, and there are external factors, what the mother will eat during the pregnancy, what drugs she might use, what viruses she might be exposed to. Right. So if we go back and look at the picture of the, div of the newborn mm -hmm. baby, we're going to see the size of the newborn brain, and next to it, we're going to see the size of the adult brain. You'll see how much growth has happened. It's about twice the size? Almost, yeah. right. And part of the reason we have such difference in size because after birth, brain development continues. It continues in many forms. First, many of these brain cells have to make different branches. They have to extend processes to communicate with each others. And if we look at the next picture, we're going to see these type of processes. The, the cell on the left is sending a long process, that's the axon down which the information will be transmitted to the next neuron. The point of contact is the synapse. The synapse is where two neurons will communicate with each other. And that is the key factor for why we're able to learn, why we can retain part of the conversation tonight. We have to have healthy synapses. In a newborn, the synapses will start developing, but between two years and uh, two months and two years of age, that's when baby will have the largest number of synapses. The babies in the brain will have a lot more synapses than they will actually end up with as an adult. If you look, you'll find that the brain is actually sculpturing itself mm. during this period. It will make so much more synapses, and with time and experience, based on the baby's experience or the child's experience, some of these synapses will be eliminated, and some of them would be strengthened. And it's really tantalizing that this critical period, when we see the largest number of synapses formed in the children, it sort of overlaps with this critical period when language acquisition mm -hmm is at its best. In fact, as Huda beautifully described, the developing brain is the product of the genes. So you're born with this incredible machine that now can absorb the environment and absorb experiences and mold itself. Just as Pat said, doesn't matter what continent you're born on, you have the ability to learn language and it doesn't matter particularly what that language is. But we know genes play an important role because we see families that have the tragic consequence of having a particular disorder uh, move throughout the family in a simple fashion. So we can look at uh, family structures, pedigrees, yeah. where we represent um, males as squares, females as circles, right. and, and show that, uh, for example, a uh, phenotype, which is uh, some recognizable characteristic or disorder, moves from parent to child and so on down through the pedigree. And that gives us a very powerful ability then to identify the genes responsible. These are rare disorders, but they give us a window into what's going on. What triggers these genes? Well, there's a cascade of events that happen. What, you know, some genes control other genes. There's a timing event during development. How cells interact, when those, as, as Hudu was describing, when the neurons move about in the developing brain, they kind of form a local environment that yeah. then communicates to their neighbors and turns on genes, turns off genes. So the repertoire of the genome 
is a complex mm -hmm. orchestra of how it is turning genes on and off in, on cues that are sometimes environmental, sometimes driven by other genes. So the interesting interplay in the next decade, I think, will be to understand the genetic predispositions that we're all walking around with. Mm -hmm. And then to what degree can we push them around, push around the outcomes by rearranging situations, interventions early in development when the brain is so plastic, when it's being, it's carving, it's, uh, it's synaptic growth and pruning, mm -hmm. and, and alter the time course of development in a way that would change the outcome. And for all the either parents or potential parents watching this, mm. what do you want them to take away from this? They should remind themselves that they're the child's first and best teachers. And uh, what they tend to do naturally, which is to interact socially, to speak in motherese, to play games with numbers and objects, and to allow uh, them to explore the kitchen. You know, the pots and pans and spoons and plates are, are, are playthings that will beat the DVDs and special programs right, uh, any right, day. Right. Well, maybe I'll, I'll elaborate on this and discuss, of course, prenatally, we know that many environmental factors affect the health of the brain, so be as healthy as you can right, be in right, nutrition, exactly. physically, yes. physically avoid drugs, alcohol, etc. But I think one thing that's really important to remember, and this is more to the parents of children with developmental disabilities, we're now learning that many of these disabilities can, at least some symptoms of them, can be reversed. So the brain is really much more plastic than we thought. Let me then ask finally, uh, what, is, what, what, what do you most want to know within your field? What's the biggest question you would like to see answered? To answer that honestly, I'm going to have to turn away from uh, questions about parents and children and say that the question I'd most like to have the answer to is, how is it possible for a human brain to think an abstract thought. You've learned on this program, you've talked about how uh, the brain only gets input from its perceptual systems and it only affects the world through its action systems. But there are limits to what we can see and there are limits to what we can do. We can close our eyes and we can imagine a line that's infinitely long, a point that's infinitely small, a series of numbers that goes on forever, and our ability to imagine those things forms the basis of everything from formal mathematics to science to technology to everything that we are. I'm very interested in understanding gene environment interactions better and co-opting that, co that yeah. to help patients. So we know that for many of the disorders, it's really about gene environment right. interaction. We're born with our genes. We can't right. do much about them, but we can do something about our environment. So finding ways to actually modify the function of genes through understanding these external environmental factors, and we know this could help many brain disorders, would be fascinating. Just like they're toxic chemicals, right. they've got to be good chemicals or good environmental factors. I'd like to know them. I think from discussions such as this, one can see that in a reasonable period of time, we're going to get an insight into what we can do with our children in order to bring out the best in them. But in addition, we can go one step further. We've really not used science to improve the educational process. It'd be nice if we could have an impact in pedagogy on how to really optimize the experience of preschool children and children in school in order to have them assimilate knowledge better. They have this enormous capability that they're born with and often school takes it out of them and we need to create an environment in which kids can use this Absolutely. in an optimal way. Yeah. Yes. The brain and mind are, are the new frontiers. Uh, we're just on the cusp of understanding how uh, abilities like language, which have been debated for centuries, what are the origins of language, how does that come together in an individual child? I'm looking forward to uh, gleaning from all of the scientists that are now coming together to talk in detail about how it works on the ground mm -hmm. and imagining that in our lifetimes we will be able to do what all parents feel like they want to do when they look in the eyes of their child and that is to understand what is going on up there. <laughs>